everyone. Welcome to our joint hearing on the proposed 2021 operating budget for the Administration, Environment, and Economic Development Committees. Please be aware this hearing is being recorded for rebroadcast on CTV Government Channel 3. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. It is also currently live on Facebook and YouTube under the Columbus City Council profile pages. I have to start out by saying that it has been both a joy and an honor to chair these committees for another year. The onset of the global pandemic certainly presented its challenges, but the constant commitment and hard work displayed by the leadership and workforce within these committees has been nothing short of impressive. As we prepare for 2021 and close out 2020, as chair of the administration committee, it is important that I acknowledge and thank all City of Columbus employees for their hard work and dedication throughout this past year. I also want to thank and recognize our presenters this evening. Nicole Brandon, Director, Department of Human Resources. Amy DeLong, Director, Civil Service Commission. David Celebrezzi, Green Spot Coordinator, Department of Public Utilities. Steve Wenzel, Assistant Director, Department of Public Service. Rosalie Hinden, Environmental Planner, Department of Recreation and Parks. And Michael Stevens, Director, Department of Economic Development. As we begin this evening with a presentation from the Administration Committee, uh, we will move through these panelists as we uh, get through the agenda. So first, we'll start with the Administration Committee, which includes the Department of Human Resources and the Civil Service Commission. We'll, we will begin tonight with this afternoon with Director Brandon. Director Brandon, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Thank you very good much. Afternoon. Again, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Remy and members of Council. Thank you for the opportunity to present the 2021 budget for the Department of Human Resources. Today, I will be covering both the general fund and the employee benefits fund budget. The 2021 general fund budget is $3,082,605, and this covers costs for personnel, supplies, and services. This is approximately $46,000 lower than the 2020 budget due to changes from 2020 to 2021, which include a 12% decrease in insurance, a 1% decrease in workers' compensation rates, no across the board increases, no allocations for merit increases or lump sum payments, and no budgeting for the 27th pay period. As a result of these changes, we were able to shift items back to the general fund from the employee benefits fund where they were more appropriately um, allocated. For example, costs associated with conferences, seminars, and topical speakers, were shifted back to the general fund. And occupational safety included $6,500 for safety supplies, which was shifted to the Employee Benefits Fund in 2020 in order for us to meet our target. And in the event that there are no CARES dollars in 2021, uh, for additional PPE, we've added $5,000 more to the safety supply budget. The 2021 Employee Benefits Fund budget is $5,594,579. And this includes costs, again, for personnel, supplies, and services. This is an approximate 8% variance from 2021. The Employee Benefits Fund includes the costs associated with, additional, with an additional labor relations specialist in that section. Uh, that is the only expansion that we made to our budget. There was no expansion in the general fund, and we have this one expansion request, which was approved for labor relations specialist in the employee benefits fund. Noteworthy contracts and programs in the department include in the general fund, the Mount Carmel police and fire fitness contract, which remains at $1,154,000 and supported by the employee benefits fund, our contracts with Baker and Hostetler that remain at $275,000 in 2021. Mount Carmel Occupational Safety and Health Clinic contract remains flat at $360,000. Other contracts that remain flat include the United Way contract for combined charitable campaign support, SafeX, CareWorks, and the AFSCME CARES program, which supplies hearing aids to members of AFSCME and CWA. Before I conclude today's presentation, I have um, to thank 
Jeannie Sprague. She is the department's fiscal manager. I need to thank her for all that she does to put our budget together. She's aware of the various needs throughout the department and is extremely thoughtful in identifying ways to meet those needs. I rely heavily on her expertise and would be remiss if I did not acknowledge her. So thank you, Jeannie. I also thank the Department of Finance and the Mayor's Office for their support and guidance during this process. And of course, City Council, specifically um, my chair, you, Chairman Remy. This concludes the budget presentation for the Department of Human Resources, and I do appreciate your favorable consideration. Uh, both Jeannie Sprague and I are here and available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, since, yeah, I mean, obviously we're gonna talk about the city as a whole, not necessarily just the Human Resource Department, which is what your presentation was just on, but, I, I just want to note that we're in the midst of negotiating a lot of our contracts uh, currently, and of course, I want to get into specifics, but um, we're asking a lot of our employees this year uh, coming up that, you know, we, we don't have the luxury of being able to afford raises. And I know um, we have a particular contract that's been ratified by the membership of the firefighters where they're taking a 0% increase next year and then subsequent years they'll have um, increases. But in general, um, this is all helping to save our workforce, correct? Mm -hmm. This is all um, a situation where we're not gonna have to make layoffs potentially because people are sacrificing for a year of not taking an increase in pay. Would that be accurate? That is accurate. I do want to, to clarify um, one thing, but you are correct. Many um, sacrifices have been made. Again, um, travel was canceled. There was no travel in 2020. Uh, we did not have any across the board increases uh, for MCP employees in particular. There were no merit increases granted and no lump sum payments. Um, those are just some of the cost saving measures that were put into place to try to uh, save money during uh, a season when we were really, really struggling with revenues in the city. Uh, with regard to our bargaining units and some of the sacrifices that they're making, you mentioned a 0% increase. The, the, all of those contracts expired at some point in 2020. And we suffered um, the most economically. And so the year one of those contracts is for 2020. So for example, um, the ASME contracts expired in March. You know, some of the contracts expired in June. There was another one in October. So all of those occurred in 2020. So at this point, for those contracts that have been ratified, you are correct. There is a 0% increase in year one for those agreements. And we appreciate um, the process that we went through with those uh, units in order to make sure that we were able to successfully you know, get a contract while at the same time remaining fiscally responsible. So I just wanted to clarify that you are correct. You're one of those contracts right now. There's a 0% increase. I just wanted to point that out. I mean, certainly thank you for the clarification on, mm -hmm. you know, when the contracts ended and the start of the new, but um, you know, it, we appreciate the partnership that our you know, labor um, bargaining units have shown in good faith the negotiations. And I know some are still ongoing, of course, but, um, you know, it's, it's a time where we've all had to step up and ask big things of people in order to make sure that, that you know, we can keep our workforce intact and the, the residents of the city of Columbus are serviced in a level that they expect to be serviced. So Absolutely. Um, thank you for your hard work Yeah, in, you. in that regard. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I appreciate uh, your presentation. I think uh, my, I, I don't see any of my colleagues. If uh, So I will uh, move on. I see Director DeLong has joined us this evening. Um, I keep saying evening, it's still afternoon. I like to start mine a little bit earlier than, uh, than some of the other ones. So um, Director DeLong, I will turn the um, podium over to you to give a, an overview of the um, budget for the Civil Service Commission. Director DeLong, thank you. Did she, did she freeze up for every, okay. Is, I, sometimes you don't know if it's. Can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. 
Yay. Sorry about that. I've been having some terrible te technical difficulties all day, and I thought I had it figured out, and obviously I, I didn't. Um, anyway, good, good afternoon, um, Chair Remy and other council members who may be listening by phone. Um, as you know, the Civil Service Commission is a part of the checks and balances of city government and is responsible for maintaining a merit system of employment to ensure that the city employment is accessible and filled with qualified and competent individuals. To that end, the commission's budget request for 2021 is $4,557,037, which reflects a slight increase from our um, overall final 2020 appropriation. And this is a result of us administering the firefighter test, which occurs every two years. So basically our, balance, our budget decreases one year, increases the next year, decreases the, and on and on because of um, that large test that we give every other year. Um, our expected expenses for um, the upcoming year in our non-uniform testing area is $665,591. And our uniform testing area is $1,463,009. And overall in our applicant services area, it's gonna be 764,588. And in our administrative area, um, which includes all of our other expenses, it's gonna be $1,663,849 which includes the $200,000 grant that we give as a part of the previous Restoration Academy, now the EDGE program that we grant out to um, various organizations. Um, this year it's with the Workforce Development Board to help those who are um, needing a second chance, um, usually with backgrounds that include felonies. Um, with this adoption of our budget, the commission will have a total of 36 full-time and 12 part-time regular positions to carry out our classification and applicant assessment responsibilities. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and be happy to entertain any questions you might have for me. Thank you so much for the long. Um, the, earlier this year, we didn't we provide uh, funding for some software to assist with with testing, if I'm not mistaken. And has that yeah. been fully implemented at this point? And how how is that software How's help? It going? Or, yes. Yes. Well, currently we had around I want to say like ninety thousand test questions that we were able to get entered into that system. Um, we are starting to develop tests currently um, with that system. And I think overall, what that system is going to allow us to do is take those test questions as we're able to use them in future tests, which we haven't been testing very much in that area because of the COVID um, and having the um, testing restrictions that we have with spacing and so forth. But hopefully that is going to allow us to look at each question individually, determine if there's adverse impact by question. It's also going to help us look at questions that may be too easy or too hard and help us, you know, overall assess the best questions that we can all ask to get the best candidates for those um, positions. Um, with the new inspector general um, role, what, what, will your department play in helping to establish that office? I am unaware right now of what's being requested of our office. I'm sorry. That's okay. I didn't mean to, <laughs> I didn't mean to ask you that question without giving you a fair, fair warning. I just didn't know if there was some relationship with civil service that had been outlined at this point. Not, not to my knowledge. No. Got it. Um, the, um, we did have a hiring freeze at one point in time early on uh, during the pandemic, but now has that been relaxed and can people, you know, tell people where they can go to look at for employment opportunities with the city of Columbus? Yep. Um, basically individuals who are interested in positions with the city can go to the Columbus website at columbus.gov and look for the um, jobs tab. Once you click on that, it will take you to all the positions that are open within the city. Although we've had a relaxed hiring year, um, when I say that, it has still been, I think, 1,100 positions 
that we've hired because of a lot of the part-time employees over in our health department that's helping with the um, tracing that we need to do as a part of COVID. Um, so people, if they're interested in positions, should definitely get on line and look for those opportunities because there is hiring that is happening with the city of Columbus, even during these most difficult times. Thank you for that information. And then um, another question that you brought up about the former Restoration Academy. Can you could you talk a little bit? Of, I mean, that, that's such a great program. How's that program been going since we've kind of pushed push it out of your area into uh, with a new partner, not a new partner, uh, an existing partner for them Absolutely. to run? Yep. Um, our program went over to the Alvis um, organization here in Columbus. And as a part of that organization, the um, candidates or the, the individuals who are going through what is called EDGE, um, I think what's been allowed to happen, I think that's most important is we've been allowed to have two opportunities a year instead of one. Through the first class, every individual um, did complete the program, which consists of, of course, the soft skills, which is the interviewing um, assessment of their abilities to you know, do a resume, learn how to do a resume, um, learn how to handle difficult situations, get reacclimated back into um, the job market. And then they've also worked with um, Goodwill as a part of one of their programs that they have there to give them some job training skills. And at the end of that program, all of those individuals had a, a type of employment. Um, we're currently in another cohort. So we're in our second one for the year already. And graduation is planned for that cohort in January, the week of January 11th. And they're going through those same opportunities. It's been a little um, more difficult because everything has been done virtually. So I haven't had as much access to those individuals as I normally have as a part of our program. Um, and there's a lot of new people over at Alvis that are now over the program. So I'm getting to learn some of the new individuals that are also leading this program. And I think they've hired some really nice people that are going to continue to push this program to the next level. I appreciate that and appreciate all the work that you do uh, within the commission. Um, we just had a commissioner step away uh, because she became employed. Stephanie Co is now working with the city attorney's office. And of course, just gained a new civil service commissioner, uh, Larry Price, over Absolutely. the summer. So um, need to get that last position filled. And, and I know the mayor's office is working on it. So keep up the great work. And thank you for the opportunity to hear for, uh, the budget overview today. Thank you so much. Next, we have David Celebrezzi, the Green Spot Coordinator through the Department of U Public Utilities. David, are you there? There he is. Looking forward yeah, to your update. So. Right, well, thanks, Councilmember Remy. Uh, Councilmember Remy, Mr. Chair, uh, President Hardin, and members of the City Council, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Celebrezzi, and I'm the Green Spot Coordinator for the City, and I work out of the Office of Sustainability at the Department of Public Utilities. And I appreciate this opportunity to let me talk briefly about the Office of Sustainability's proposed budget for 2021. I'd like to highlight the Office of Sustainability and some of the programs and initiatives we'll be undertaking in the next year. So the proposed funding level for the office uh, in Mayor Andrew J. Ginther's proposed 2021 budget is approximately $725,800. This represents an 18% reduction from the current level, which is $8,000. I'm sorry, $890,000. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the proposed funding level for the office represents uh, personnel expenditures, supplies and services. Uh, the office has five full-time uh, staff, which is an assistant director of sustainability, a green spot coordinator, and three members of our public outreach team. So the breakdown of supplies and services includes dollars for our green spot community backyards program, which is one of our most successful programs as well as other green spot material. Our supplies and services uh, budget allows the contractors, interns, uh, sponsor events, and have pilot programs. So currently, we have a great relationship with uh, Franklin Soil and uh, Water Conservation District. And through this partnership, we're able to provide water cycle and stormwater education to middle school age children we also partner with the Ohio State University to hire interns from their environmental and sustainability programs 
in the summer. And the majority of our supplies is, is to support Green Spot, which is the city's main um, sustainability outreach program. And it provides a platform where households, businesses, community groups, and now neighborhoods can make commitments to conserve and protect water, conserve energy, uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, uh, support green transportation, and education. Uh, folks can go and register online. It is a free program to columbus.gov forward slash green spot. Uh, currently, we have more than 20,000 members, and we're working to increase this to 22,000 members by the end of 2021. Uh, we'll continue to work with businesses and helping them achieve their sustainability goals through our e-dashboard uh, platform, our Green Spot Sustainability course, uh, which is for businesses, and our business e-newsletter. We'll continue distributing our new Green Home Guide. Uh, we'll recruit at least one new uh, neighborhood to become designated as a green spot neighborhood. We'll hold our green spotlight award celebration. Most likely it'll be virtually again uh, next year and continue engaging stakeholders on our green spot advisory board uh, with about a dozen projects or so that they have they're working on. So our office also will continue to grow by working to help implement the 2030 sustainable Columbus goals, which have four pillars. These pillars are green spot, conserve and protect natural resources, climate and energy, and waste reduction. It will also implement our portion of the American Cities Climate Challenge Grant and continue to engage residents on Blueprint Columbus. So we look forward to another busy year engaging the community uh, and especially listening to their input and incorporating their input and in taking action to help Columbus be a sustainability leader. So thank you. Uh, uh, Council Member Remy, uh, President Hardin, and members. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, David. I appreciate your continued uh, leadership in that that department, and certainly very, very important uh, to our to help meet our sustainability goals, and and certainly just overall for the residents of Columbus. Uh, you. 20,000 last year was it or was that it was this year wasn't it you have to remind me the day yeah, everything seems like it was like 10 years ago now it really does oh uh, yes so um we hit the goal i want to say earlier uh, this year or the, the end towards the end of last year Well, I, I, and, and so the new Able goal to is to, yeah, I can, it's kind of going in and out, but the new goal then is to go hit 20,000 by 25, right? Uh, so we want another, another, another 20,000, yeah, by 2030. So it's I know. 2030, I keep pushing it. Have 40,000 green spot. <laughs> we, hey, you know, this, the way I look at it, this is the basement, right? This is the bottom floor. Uh, that we will hit, and then it's only going to go up from there. Yeah, I, I teasingly say that um, we. I knew the date was twenty thirty, but certainly want to make sure that uh, those that are listening go. Uh, where would they go for uh, additional green spot information and and to try to rally their own neighborhoods to get involved with this with this really important program? Sure. Uh, they can they can go to uh, columbusgreenspot.org. Uh, they can contact me at greenspot at columbus.gov. Uh, I'm, you know, I want to work with all neighbors, all folks, uh, all businesses to help them achieve their sustainability goals. So we have a suite of resources that we can provide. Um, and yeah, we want to make Columbus the, the greenest city here. Well, and certainly a certainly appreciate your efforts and uh the, your leadership in that program because it's it's like i said a very important one and uh we appreciate all that you've been doing um thank you for your review next you. we have That's steve important. wenzel the of course uh next we have steve wenzel the assistant director of the department of public service steve the floor is yours Thank you, Chair Remy, uh, other members of council that might be on. Um, again, thank you for this opportunity to present the highlights of the Department of Public Services proposed 2021 operating budget, specifically as it relates to refuse collection. 
I'm, I'm going to give an overview of the department's budget overall, and then I'll dive del dive deeper into just refuse collection and, and some of the budget items that we have there. Um, so the Department of Public Services is comprised of the director's office plus five divisions. We have the refuse collection division, parking services, infrastructure management, traffic management, and the design and construction division. So overall in 2020, we have a proposed funding level of $137 million for the Department of Public Service. This represents a 0.9% decrease or almost $1.2 million as compared to the 2020 operating budget. Most of this decrease is attributed to lower than expected revenues and corresponding expenditures that's associated with our parking meter collection program. This is due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and some of the traffic downtown and in some of our other neighborhoods, we're just not seeing it as much um, as we're looking at meter collections. Um, the overall budget will fund 844 full and part-time personnel that provide some of the most core city services, including refuse collection, which of course contains residential bulk and recycling, um, maintaining and improving our roadways, we're fixing potholes and plowing snow, installation and maintenance of traffic signals, signage, pavement markings, to promote the safety of our citizens. Publicly, ma publicly managed parking and making Columbus a safer city for pedestrians and bicyclists. So going more into the refuse collection division now, in 2021, the division of refuse collection, we have a proposed funding level of $37.5 million. That's made up of 33.9 million um, allocated from the general fund, as well as 3.6 million that's allocated from the street construction maintenance and repair fund. Um, this represents a minor increase over the 2020 operating budget of just 1%. Um, as far as that $37.5 million, 17 million or 45% of the total refuse budget is related to personnel expenditures. Um, 163,400 is for materials and supplies. Uh, 20.2 million is for services. We kind of break that down um, into our major categories. 9.5 million of that is related to recycling and yard waste contract that we have. Um, and we have another 9.9 .9 million that's um, for maintenance of our fleet refuse uh, that we pay through our fleet maintenance division. Uh, we have 52,000 for claims and another 10,000 for equipment. So just to kind of put that in perspective, if you look at just the personnel, the, contact that we, the contract that we have for recycling and yard waste, and our fleet costs, that accounts for $36.1 million or 97.1% of the total refuse budget. This proposed funding for refuse will support 226 full-time personnel that provide tra trash collection services to more than 340,000 households every week, 52 weeks a year. Of that 226 full-time personnel, we're gonna dedicate 24 um, person, staff members to support the Clean Neighborhoods Initiative to address the persistent problem of illegal dumping in our neighborhoods. Um, we're allocating a total budget of $1.9 million for that effort. This includes advancing policies to include continuing the replacement of 300 gallon refuse containers with 90 gallon containers. We're increasing staff numbers to crews to dedicate just the solid waste inspection and alley cleanups. Um, continuing to utilize and install cameras and working with the Department of Public Safety to capture and prosecute illegal dumpers within our community. And we're also going to educate residents on how to assist us with illegal dumping and how do we stop it within our neighborhoods. So, so far this year, illegal dumping initiative has been a great success. Um, refuse collection crews dedicated to pick up and dispose of illegally dumped materials have picked up 6,200 tons of debris in our neighborhoods and our alleyways. Uh, included in that number is over 33 tons or over 3,100 tires that have been illegally dumped in our roadways. <clears throat> Another important part of the Division of Refuse Collection, it's the home of our Keep Columbus Beautiful program or what we call KCB. Every year, KCB staff work with thousands of volunteers from neighborhoods, businesses, schools, churches, and other community organizations to clean litter from Columbus streets. 
In 2020, the KCB team partnered with 43 volunteer groups for litter abatement and beautification. In total, 632 volunteers contributed over 1,200 hours to pick up almost 27,000 pounds of litter from the public rights of way. And they helped enhance areas with trees, flowers, and removal of weeds and brush. These numbers are significantly down from last year. This is due to you know, COVID-19, but we think next year we're gonna be able to turn around a little bit more and we're gonna continue these efforts with the KCB in 2021. As a part of the budget proposal, as I mentioned earlier, we will continue the city's residential recycling program to more than 201,000 households, apartments, and multifamily complexes. This has been a successful recycling program. Since the program started in 2012 through October of this year, residents have recycled over 260,000 tons of materials, saving the city almost $14.3 million in tipping fees at the county landfill. So far this year to date, um, through October, residents have recycled 27,300 tons of materials, um, which is roughly about 10.4% over the same period last year, saving over $1.4 million in tipping fees. That concludes my presentation of the 2021 Department of Public Service operating proposed operating budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions the council might have. Thank you so much, um, Assistant Director. We, we, I also want to acknowledge that we have Tim, Tim Swagger, the Administrator for the Department of Refuse, uh, who was joined us this evening and uh, wanted to, some of these questions might uh, go to you and some might go to, to Tim. Um, you know, you just mentioned about the recycling diversion rate and um, how that has um, been progressing nicely, thankfully, uh, towards um, the goals that Swaco has set. And certainly, you know, one of those, the chief things, not only is it great for the environment, but it also reduces our tipping fees. But the budget refl reflects that we're slowly creeping towards this 20% diversion rate um, via, our via the recycling program. Can you guys talk about uh, what services doing to increase that diversion rate? Sure, uh, I'll just kind of like summarize kind of what we're seeing this year and then I'll let Tim um, chime in also. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in our presentation, we're roughly around 10% this year, higher than what we were last year. Um, so our diversion rate is, is this year is steadily creeped up um, uh, as compared to the 20%, the year 20, 22, 23% that we've been seeing in years past. And a lot of that, of course, has to do with um, the COVID-19 pandemic because what we're seeing is, you know, since a lot more people are at home and staying at home, we're seeing basically two things happen. Our tipping tonnage is actually going up um, for trash, as well as we're seeing a lot of increases in people recycling too. Since they're at home more, they're creating more trash, they're creating more recycling. So those numbers are obviously going up. Um, some of the initiatives that we're looking at doing, I'll let Tim go more into, um, but I think we have a good plan to increase some of those numbers and working with some of our partner agencies like Swaco, uh, to get more of the messaging out in some of our lower performing areas. Um, but yeah, Tim, if you want to go ahead and uh, add anything to that, I'd be happy to. Yeah, thanks, uh, Steve, and thanks, Councilmember Remy. Uh, yeah, some of the stuff we're working on is we're trying to expand our uh, recycling efforts into the multifamily and seeing what we can do there. We've got a pilot project that we'll be doing this uh, spring at around 60 to 65 multifamily homes. Uh, complexes. That'll be in a partnership with Swaco and the recycling partnership through a grant that they've offered us. That's where we see our biggest growth uh, going is if we can get more recycling in the multifamily. Approximately one third of our residential uh, customers live in multifamily complexes and we're trying to get into that marketplace, provide them recycling opportunities. We're going to do it through the pilot program, see what uh, numbers, what how clean we can keep the fill how successful it can be. And then on top of that, more education. And again, we're going to repeat the um, the program we had last year, uh, the Feet on the Street, where we went through and tagged cans and that. Uh, we're working with Swaco uh, to try to develop a plan where we can do that in 
each of the summer months this year. So we do June, July, and August and hit areas of town that, that proved to be very successful. It got not only increased recycling, but it got it cleaner for us. So we had better recycling, which then helps us reduce costs as well. Thank, thank you, Tim and, and Steve. Appreciate that. Um, you know, very glad to see the continued expansion of the Clean Neighborhoods Initiative. Um, but, you know, as we know, um, it's almost time and time again, you go through and clean up an, an alley uh, and then come back, you know, sometimes just days later and it's full again. Can you talk about how pairing our cleanup efforts with the additional enforcement activities, the how that's benefited in the in the types of successes we're seeing as a result of that? Thanks, Council Member. I'll, I'll let Tim address that. I know we're working closely with the city attorney's office and, and environmental judges down at the municipal court, but I know Tim's more familiar with that than I am, so um, I'll throw it over to Tim. Yes, council member. Um, so, yeah, you're right. We're, we're, we're chasing some of these areas where we can go into it every week, every two weeks. Now, the conversion uh, from 300 to 90 has proven successful on two fronts. We're seeing less debris and litter, and then we're also seeing a lot less illegal dumping. So having 90-gallon containers, specifically if we can move them to the front, has been very successful. It's giving people less opportunity to dump into the 300-gallon containers, so there's less capacity. So when the, the residents are able to store it on their property, push it out front, pull it back, which is 96% of the city currently does that already. We're targeting some of the areas where we can. So that's really helping clean up those neighborhoods, getting the, the illegal dumping. And then the changes that uh, council passed uh, that we proposed back in all, well, went into effect, passed in July, went into effect at the end of August to allow for the civil violations. Uh, that has helped tremendously. Uh, we have, as of last week, we had done um, 54 criminal charges in 2020 for illegal dumping. That's up from 20 last year to 54 this year. But just since August 31st, when the Title 13 changes have gone into effect, we've issued 63 civil violations. So that's giving us a lot more opportunity to, you know, education's our first goal. Educate the residents, make sure they understand what they can and can't do and have the proper disposal. But at some point, we have to follow it up with the enforcement side. And that's what we were able to do with those changes that we made this summer um, and the solid waste investigators who were now up to five of those. So we've split the city up a lot, smaller areas. They're now starting to locate those habitual illegal dumping dumpers and the locations. And we're starting to attack those through evil civil, either civil or criminal charges. On the 300 through the, to the 90, you know, conversion program, um, Obviously, you, you mentioned that about 96% of our residents are now back to 90s, but there's still some more work to be done. And just could you explain just briefly how that process has worked? It's not it's been systematic and you, you didn't do it all overnight. Uh, what what should people expect? Um, I mean, and why wouldn't some areas change from 300 to 90? Um, I know it, it, if it were up to you, they all would, but there are some limitations. Yeah, Council Member, that's a great question. So on our conversion, we started it really in the summer of 2015. Uh, we had almost 16,300 gallon containers out in the field. Uh, since then, we've converted over 3,500 of those uh, 300 gallon containers to 90. So we have 12,000 left in the field. We normally do one area a month, uh, which is about... When we pull out a, in which you have to, on the 300 gallons, when you pull one out, that means four people are getting 90 gallon containers. So when we say that we've transferred 3,500, 300 gallon containers, that means 12,000 households have been switched over approximately. So when we do that uh, in those areas, it we can do about one area a month because it takes time to notify and make sure we have it and our staff, because this is additional work that we're not um, increasing. We're just working it into our normal workflow. We normally do one one conversion a month and we rotate it around the city so that way we do we have three stations each station does one and then next month and we rotate that around that way we're equally applying it to the city and to the areas we can so that conversion will continue we're doing another one this month we'll we'll start back up in march uh we take january february off uh, just due to some other workload issues when that starts back up um we'll continue to evaluate 
we want to switch, as you said, every house that we can from a 300 to 90 because it, it cleans it up and makes it more efficient, gets us out of the alleys with our big trucks doing damage. And, you know, from an efficiency standpoint, the refuse collection division can pick up more houses faster, you know, when we go down the front. What stops us from doing everybody is some places they have too many hills in the front. Like it's not reasonable to expect someone to push it down to the front curb to pick up. The other one would be is if there's too much on-street parking where there are no places for the container to sit so that our truck could come down and, and collect. So a lot of our areas of the city where there are no driveways or they have very limited access for garages and things like that, that those are the areas that are, that are very difficult for us to uh, accommodate. I know we've had people reach out to our office uh, about their particular area. Do you post, you know, kind of the, up to, the updated plan for, you know, what you plan to tackle in 2021 uh, for that conversion? Yeah, we're working on that right now. We have the 2020 conversion, which we bumped back. We normally would stop in this, uh, November. We were because of COVID. We did miss a month there at the beginning of March and April. We missed uh, staying on track. So we'll finish that up in December. And then in January, February, we'll plan for 2021, all the areas that we're going to convert. And we'll put that online like we had the uh, 2020 uh, conversion plan. Excellent. And then you mentioned the Title 13 changes. Could you talk a little bit about um, what that means to, you know, our landlords and tenant relationships? I mean, a lot of people we hear constantly about set out, so don't get called. And I know there's a definition issue there, but what what has that meant to your code inspectors and and what should people expect moving forward? Yes, sir. So the t changes in Title 13, what they're allowing us to do is hold either both uh, the tenant and or the landlord responsible for any of the violations. So if we if we if you have a tenant move out and leaves everything, it's the landlord's responsibility to take care of that responsibly, not our the city of Columbus's cost. So if we can't identify the previous tenant, we can hold the landlord under the new Title 13. Also, any materials brought out that are not municipal waste, solid waste that will go into the container in a bag in your normal trash container, they either have to be scheduled before they're put out and placed out on, you know, within the time frame, 72 hours prior for bulk, but it also has to qualify what is bulk. So when somebody moves out of a, a an apartment or a, a house and they all the furniture is left, that is a landlord responsibility to dispose of properly, not the city of Columbus. So you can no longer set a whole house out at the curb and expect the city to come by and collect it at our at the taxpayer's expense. So those are the changes in Title 13 where we can now hold those property and landlords own, owner ex, uh, responsible for those set outs. Um, and then finally, I, I'll just take the opportunity. Could you just go over the bulk policy? I mean, one of the one I like to try to throw a good tidbit of information out there. Um, you need to call on schedule. Um, and basically, the reason for this is is that you you schedule your trucks according to volume. So that's why there's an, you know, they're, they're expected to give kind of a, uh, an expectation or an estimation of the materials that are put going to be put out so you can schedule the trucks accordingly uh, from a volume perspective. And, you know, generally what's the policy as far as when bulk will be collected. And then finally, um, you know, why does it vary sometimes, I, you know, like for instance, OSU move in, in a non COVID time anyway. Yeah, so on, on when scheduling bulk, we like you said, we, we know how much our trucks can hold and how many trips they can go uh, collect and how many households they can get in a typical day. So we normally have that number of slots at each location filled, typically about 60 to 100 stops per location. So we're normally doing two to 300 bulk pickup stops every day in the city of Columbus. We, uh, in, when, you, when you run that into a week and a month, we're doing 12,000 bulk stops every month. So we have to schedule those and, and plan those out. Normally, when you call in or schedule that bulk, it's one to two weeks from the time you call it. And we do it on your collection day. So if you call in on your collection, it's either the following collection week or two weeks out, depending on our, our workload. It does ebb and flow based on uh, some of the other operations that affect us. And as you mentioned, OSU move out. We have to put a lot of effort in down there to mask 
we get 30,000 people moving over the a course of three or four weekends. So I always tell our folks, it's, you're talking one of our suburbs entirely moving all in one, you know, three or four weeks. So we put that effort, extra effort down there and our extra forces that would normally help out throughout the city have to be allocated down there. So during those times, our bulk set outs could bump to three or four weeks. Uh, but we, we certainly try to minimize any of that as we can. But if you don't schedule it and you set it out, the problem we have is it's not to be set out till 72 hours prior, because if you set it out and we're not scheduled for a week or two, those piles tend to accumulate other items and people start to, you know, it starts to blow down the street or other people start throwing stuff on. And that's when we get the, you know, we get the illegal dumping and the complaints and also um, our truck capacity doesn't meet what we have out there because you called in a couch and now when we get there, there's 10 items that have grown in that pile. Thank you for that. Um, just wanted to put it out there for people that are listening and to have a better understanding of our bulk policy. Certainly appreciate all that you do, Tim, with the department. Thank you, Assistant Director Wenzel. We appreciate uh, your work in public service and look forward to um, you know, a successful passage to the budget. Um, appreciate your overview. Next, we will move on to Rosalie Hinden, who is um, over our urban forestry master plan. And uh, glad that she could be here today to kind of give us an overview in the environment committee, what that means. And so, Rosalie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Remy, and hello to any members of council listening. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you on the Urban Forestry Master Plan. Again, I'm Rosalie Hendon. I'm an environmental planner with the Recreation and Parks Department, and I'm also the project manager for the Urban Forestry Master Plan. And it's great to be here. Uh, it reminded me that I was here last year talking to you about getting started uh, on the contract to write this plan, and here we are a year later, and we're very close to finishing. So. Um, Appreciate that, and I'm happy to report that we are in the process of incorporating stakeholder comments to our master plan, and we are getting ready to kind of take our second draft and in the first quarter of 2021, uh, presenting for a public comment period before we uh, go to council and ask for action around the, uh, the master plan. So just a little update on, on the progress that we've made and um, grateful for the support. So uh, for 2021, we are looking towards implementation of the master plan because like I said, we're very close to finalizing the plan. And uh, there's a couple different line items from a couple different funding sources that I'd like to uh, share with you. So there are three line items in the Recreation and Parks capital budget. We have $400,000 that uh, we have every year four street tree contracts, so that will continue uh, in the 2021 budget as well. Well, it was the 2020 capital budget, but we'll spend it next year. Uh, as well, we have $450,000 that we refer to as EAB just because the funding started uh, during the middle of the Emerald Ash Borer crisis. Now, uh, we've been using that funding for both contracts and for part-time staff to augment the forestry operations that we have going. Um, so that is uh, 450,000, like I mentioned, that's a different line item in the Recreation and Parks capital budget. We also, uh, we're, we were awarded a million dollars of our unfunded priorities to go towards the Urban Forestry Master Plan implementation. We were, very excited to see that. We're still determining how to best use those funds, but it will likely be a combination of equipment for forestry, site preparation in order to plant uh, more street trees, and planting contracts. So that's the three line items in the capital budget. And I also wanted to share that we have two uh, community development block grant projects or CDBG projects that will be funded uh, in 2021. We, have, we were awarded $250,000 for a round of street tree inventories. So uh, essentially, this, is, this has been a big theme of our master plan. Our 
City of Columbus public, public tree inventory. So all the trees along streets and in parks, they, uh, we have that inventory done in 1997, and it has not been substantially updated since that time. Meaning that while some things about trees don't change, like the species of trees, uh, a lot of things do, like the size and the health. And so it's harder to manage a resource that you don't have updated information about. So that's a big priority coming out of the master plan. And to that end, we requested and were awarded uh, this 250000 to continue street tree inventories across uh, five communities. So, and the way that we chose those communities was based also on the master plan analysis that we did. We had a priority planting analysis that looked across the city of Columbus and uh, using what our stakeholder group had selected, uh, nine different social equity factors were combined to make a social equity index. And so the communities that we have prioritized to be inventoried uh, are, were selected based on that priority analysis. So these are communities that have both low tree canopy cover and they have a high social equity need. The, ver the very number one community actually I'll share it was South Linden, and we have already inventoried the street trees in South Linden uh, this summer. And the power of having updated information is that now we know both what existing trees need in terms of care. There were, you know, if there's hazardous trees that need to be removed, so we can immediately uh, plan for that maintenance work that's required. But we also, and this is something we've never had, uh, we are collecting potential planting sites, which is going to allow us to be much more proactive and already have a bank of suitable sites that uh, an arborist has already checked on the ground and understands that, you know, it is a wide enough tree lawn, that there's not overhead utilities, uh, that it's suitable for a street tree. And what size of street tree, if it's a small, medium, or a large class tree. So it's really exciting to get these updates. And because of uh, having that updated inventory in South Linden, we were able to turn around and plant 500 street trees there this fall. So that is the reason that we're focusing first on the inventories is because once we have that information, then we can act on that information. So I mentioned the 250,000. So we already did South Linden. The next five communities are Far South, Milo Grogan, um, south side, southwest, and north central. So just going down the line of the priority neighborhoods out of that analysis. We also were awarded from CDBG funds $170,500 for street and park tree plantings, and those will also be in the same priority neighborhoods that we determined from the urban forestry uh, master plan analysis. So in total, we have 1.85 million from our Recreation and Parks capital budget, as well as $420,500 uh, from the CDBG funding that we were awarded for a total of $2.27 million going towards uh, forestry efforts in 2021. We appreciate the support of the Urban Forestry Master Plan throughout this entire process. It's been over a year that we've been actively working on writing this plan. And uh, we appreciate the support from, from city council, from the mayor's office, from departmental leadership. It wouldn't have been possible to get here without your support. And we will continue to need your support as we move towards implementation next year. Looking ahead, I mentioned the importance of this street tree inventory and how out of date it is. So, like I mentioned, we did South Linden. We're planning on these next five communities. It's going to equal about 10% of the overall um, city, city land area. And so we will be looking for uh, funding to, in order to continue to update the street tree inventory. Ideally, um, in discussions with our leadership, uh, our director would love to see us do that in two years. We'll see if, you know, it, it is. Um, substantial in terms of just if someone going out and walking each street and looking at the trees and assessing them uh, as well as sites. So I just wanted to mention that we will be looking uh, for, for funding on that. 
building on the success that we've already had and the grant assistance that we've already received. Uh, and then this is not related to the Urban Forestry Master Plan, but since this is the environmental budget hearing, uh, I did want to share an important environmental project that we plan to present to Council in the first quarter of 2021. This has been a significant effort in our department, and it is to write uh, nature preserve code. So this would be to codify protections for our 19 city nature preserves above and beyond what is already protected uh, and regulated in parkland. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak about this project. It's so exciting that this is our first ever Urban Forestry Master Plan. Thank you. Well, thank you for uh, leading that effort um, over the last year or so. Um, you know, our tree canopy coverage is around 22%. We're, we're significantly lagging some of our peer cities like Cincinnati at 38, Pittsburgh 42, et cetera. Um, but we're, we're now, you know, with a plan, we can now make significant efforts and certainly with this inventory, uh, very, very important. Can you talk, uh, can you just tell people out there that may be listening um, what the importance of a robust tree canopy is as far as like diminishing, uh, you know, a heat island, for instance, et cetera. So if you could talk about that, that'd be, be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the Urban Forestry Master Plan, it's important because it's looking at the entire, all the trees in Columbus, public property, private property, nature doesn't distinguish between property boundaries. And so it is all one system, it's all one forest, and that's where the term urban forest comes from. And trees are particularly important in the urban environment because they are providing us benefits. And so in Columbus, like any large city, we're facing uh, certain challenges just from the environment that we live in. So we know that cities are hotter than rural areas. There's usually several degrees difference, which translates to more days over 90 degrees, translating to health impacts, especially for our vulnerable populations, those who are older, those who are suffering from respiratory issues, children. And so by adding trees or by maintaining the trees that we have, preserving the trees that we have, those, um, every resident is benefiting from cooler air, shade, making our city more walkable, uh, cooling. There's, um, you know, when you plant your tree near your house, you have uh, energy savings. They're, they provide air filtration. There's a lot of health benefits, which is even more, you know, as we know, important. Uh, this has been a year for uh, really focusing on community health, public health. But there's also mental health benefits. There's been studies showing, there's a really interesting study out of Baltimore showing that if you control other, all the other variables, increasing tree cover is associated with a decrease in crime. And so there's a lot of benefits to um, having trees living and, and working near trees and uh, Council Member Remy, you mentioned that 22% canopy cover is what Columbus has right now, and that's true. And it's also true that that canopy is not equitably distributed across the city. There's a huge, uh, huge range between 9% cover in downtown with all the hard surfaces that are there to 41% in Clintonville. And so those residents who don't have access to trees they are not experiencing benefits at the same level as other, other residents in Columbus. And so that's another theme uh, in the master plan is that not only do we want to grow our canopy, but we want to invest uh, in equitable canopy and focus on those, like I mentioned, those priority neighborhoods that both need to grow canopy, but also have a, even more of a need for the benefits that trees provide. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Appreciate all of your work and effort in uh, that answer. So appreciate the overview. Uh, um, next, we'll go on to our third and final uh, committee of the evening, certainly not the least important, uh, our Economic Development um, Committee. Uh, we will turn the floor over to our director, Mike, Mike Steven, Michael Stevens. Director Stevens, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chair Ramey. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of Development's portion 
of the 2021 operating budget. I am joined today by our Deputy Director for Jobs and Economic Development, Quinton Harris. Our general fund proposes, proposal totals $29.5 million. Our budget proposal supports initiatives in four areas, increasing the number of affordable housing units through our housing programs and land bank strategies, support entrepreneurship and job creation through economic development, ensure safe and secure housing through our code enforcement division, and looking to the future with our planning and growth efforts. Our economic development division is charged with cultivating entrepreneurship within our neighborhoods and leveraging private investment and job creation. Columbus's diverse economy and skilled workforce continues to attract new jobs and investment. This year, council has approved 20 deals creating and retaining over 1,300 jobs and $270 million in private investment. In addition, our public-private partnerships have leveraged $28.77 in private investment for every $1 of city investment. To build on these efforts, our economic development operating budget is $4.6 million. This includes $1.9 million for personnel and administration of $29 million in capital funds, $1.2 million for contracts supporting our community partners, and 935,000 for small business and entrepreneurship, and 600,000 for various economic development operations, including marketing and professional services. Our planning division works on a wide variety of projects and programs, which are aimed at improving the quality of Columbus neighborhoods. Planning for our future growth can only be effective if it is conducted in partnership with our community. We will continue to initiate innovative techniques for increased community engagement as the city grows. I do want to take this time to recognize and um, compliment our planning division for how well they adjusted to um, the virtual world that uh, the pandemic has uh, has brought us. Uh, for development to occur in this city, um, they play an important role in some of our um, review commissions and the ability they've made to uh, go to the a virtual environment was really critical. Um, in 2020, planning launched the Columbus Planning Classroom to engage neighborhoods in planning topics related to the city's future growth. In addition, in addition, efforts continued on the implementation of the Columbus Citywide Planning Policies, or C2P2. I'm pleased to report that 16 communities have adopted C2P2 guidelines. Our budget proposal for planning is approximately $2 million and is used for administration purposes. 96% of this budget amount will be used for personnel and 4% for operations. I want to take this time to thank uh, development's fiscal team for all the hard work they do throughout the year, as well as for putting this budget together. Uh, this has been an extraordinary year. Um, development, working with our colleagues in finance and across the city, has been responsible for getting over $60 million in CARES contracts uh, out the door and, and funding those important human services and small business needs that have uh, arisen because of the pandemic. And that fiscal team has been critical in, in making that happen. Uh, and they're led by Bill Webster, our assistant director, who continues to do a great job on that. And I want to thank him and his team. I also want to thank uh, the Department of Finance, especially our budget analyst, Lynn Beatty, for the support they provide us. And then uh, finally, Council Member, I want to thank you. It's uh, been a pleasure working with you and your leadership of the Economic Development Committee as we have focused on uh, continuing to drive prosperity and growth in our community. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director. Certainly, uh, thank you and your team. Um, it has uh, absolutely been a pleasure to work with you. And um, when were you named uh, switch from interim to permanent director? Was that, that was this year, wasn't it? It was, it was April. <laughs> it seems like seven years ago, but only yeah. you know, eight well, months. Economic development. Development does age and in, in every year is equal. It's kind of like dog years to seven years. So, um, but your team did an, an outstanding job, Quentin, uh, of course, your, your work in getting those CARES dollars out. It, it really was really rewarding to see, you know, everybody work so hard to help so many people in need. And so really want to thank you publicly for that that effort it it certainly i know it was uh no easy task and but it had such a great effect on so many people in their businesses so really um hats off and and applaud you for that um 
I do have some questions, um, not necessarily budget related, but but certainly economic development related. You know, we're gonna we're embarking on this and this uh, zoning code review. You know, and and so I want to understand what you envision this potentially doing to the Department of Economic Development for the city. And are there current sections that hinder development in the city because of it? I mean, I think we know as council that there's an inordinate number of, you know, uh, zoning cases that we have to hear. And we don't have a 21st century, you know, zoning code. But as we're, as we continue to grow, that this is a, a Kind of as it relates to economic development. Yeah, thank you, Chair Remy. Um, it's okay. I'll lead off, and Quentin has some additional thoughts. Uh, I welcome those as well. Um, we're really um, pleased to be working with Department of Building and Zoning Services and Director Messer and his team, and actually within the Department of Development, one of our colleagues, um, Kevin Wheeler, is is is, is working um, very closely on the zoning code rewrite. We see too many uh, zonings by variance, uh, which, and that's what's coming to council. Um, we really feel like if we can streamline uh, our zoning code, make it uh, more inclusive, uh, it, it's going to help uh, expedite the process to make development happen, whether it's uh, commercial development or residential development, any things we can do to help streamline that. Um, it doesn't mean that the community is not going to be engaged. I think that's a key thing we need to emphasize uh, yeah. by updating the zoning code. I, I still expect we're, we're going to have a robust level of community engagement, which is important. Uh, it just it's going to bring some certainty to the process. And Quinn, I know when you talk to developers and site selection professionals and companies, that is one of the biggest things they ask for is certainty in, in developing the timeline. They they understand our process. They want to engage with our communities. They just want to understand the have some certainty in, in, in that process. So I think the work that's going to be done over the next couple of years to update the zoning code is really going to help that. Brendan, did I miss anything on that? No, you didn't. You said everything perfectly, Director. Thank you. Quinton, on more of these calls then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's also important to note, and I know you kind of mentioned this in your remarks, but again reiterating the fact that despite the pandemic development has moved ahead full charge you know here in the city of columbus and and i think you know from the beginning i've i've asked constantly for updates on how are things progressing you know is anything stalled and and really the answer is no and and in fact we still uh you know, potentially in the future. Um, just any comments that you might have on that and really what that's a testament to here in the city of Columbus. Well, thank you, Chair Remy. I'm just gonna be really brief and then I'm gonna ask Quentin kind of highlights how the team in economic development made the adjustment um, to the pandemic and some of the remote working and how they continue to engage with local businesses on retention effort and our efforts to continue to attract. So, Quinn, if you can just give a couple highlights on, on some of that work that the team did, that'd be great. Yes, thank you, Chair Amy. Um, from a development perspective, I think, uh, as you will find in economic development, we try to pivot uh, to the scenario uh, the best way we know how, and working remotely did cause a little change in the way that we conduct business, uh, but ultimately we adjusted companies adjusted, developers adjusted, and at the end of the day, uh, we have been very productive um, in partnership with all of our departments that's typically part of the development process, BZS, uh, Department of Public Utilities, Public Service have been very accommodating to us uh, and the companies and developers that we have worked with, uh, and we haven't missed a beat. We, um, through the last downturn in 09, 010, I think the city positioned itself very well to grow out of the, the pandemic uh, that or the fiscal scenario that we had back in, in 09 and 10. And we have positioned ourselves now to be very ready to have a lot of accessible sites uh, and um, 
partners that are ready to move and we have been doing so throughout the, the this year um, and based on that and our flexibility uh, we have been very productive as the director said we have closed uh, over 20 development projects uh, which is very good in comparison to what a lot of communities around the country have done from an economic development perspective uh, we have uh, approximately 700 net new jobs that are part of those agreements uh, and, and close to a half billion dollars in new investments from a typical job creation perspective. And we have a number of very large development projects uh, that took a little pause um, at the onset of the pandemic uh, during the March through April timeframe, but then picked back up and have been steadily um, uh, moving, which is a testament and will, I think, position the city very well coming out of the pandemic with a lot of the new office, retail, and residential projects that we will have that'll come online about the time that we transition out of the pandemic. Chair Remy, if I might just add, one of the things that sure. we uh, identify as being really important as we uh, plan for a re economic recovery uh, from this pandemic is making sure it's as inclusive as possible. And those partners that we fund through this budget, like One Columbus and Rev One and the Chamber and others, they are embracing our equity agenda and, and, and the prosperity for all. And they realize we just can't recover uh, for two thirds of our community. It's gotta be uh, inclusive throughout our community. So um, I'm pleased that those partners we're funding understand that and are working with to advance that agenda. Thank you. That's a very good point. Um, you know, we've got a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that everybody feels, you know, the positivity here in the city of Columbus and, and certainly after a pandemic, um, that can be much more exasperated. So we, we, we've got to make sure we continue our policies and, and sometimes dig deeper, even as it relates to housing and, and that sort of thing. So appreciate you, both your efforts on that. Um, it's been, uh, again, a pleasure working with you. And so looking forward to 2021. Director Stevens, Assistant Director Harris, thank you uh, for coming by today. We do have uh, three speakers this evening, and I would like to uh, invite our first one down. I'm going to ask each of them to state their name, their address, and any organization they might uh, represent. The first speaker that we have this evening is Leah Bruno. Leah, if you're available, we're ready for your testimony. Hi. Yes, I have had the privilege of meeting a few of you. Um... But for those of you who have not met, my name is Leah Brudno. I am a board member and a committee chair on the Highland West Civic Association over in the Highland West um, neighborhood, which is, I guess, better known as North and Central Hilltop, east of Hague. Um, we have quite a few concerns and and you know thoughts and and things that we have been bringing up um, to the city and to the council members over the last few years. And I just wanted to bring up a couple of those tonight to make sure that those are still you know, on people's minds and especially as we are going forward into the 2021 budget, um, making sure that some of this stuff is is allocated for. Um, we have been very involved the last couple of years with a few different plans that the city's put forward, the Envision Hilltop plan uh, this past year, the comprehensive um, neighborhood safety plan, the clean initiative, or sorry, clean neighborhood um, plan, everything that was put forward by the city that I imagine, you know, was spent a lot of money on and a lot of community time, both by community members and by city leaders. And so we're really hoping that in this 2021 budget, we're starting to see uh, that some of the steps put forward in each of these plans, we're really going to start getting some budgetary support and not just that the, the verbal support that we've been hearing. Um, we have consistently been told, you know, through these plans and by the mayor in, in recent speeches that the west side and the hilltop specifically are a priority for the city that our neighborhood is a priority and while we appreciate that we do want to make sure that it is reflected in the upcoming budget specifically with regards to our trash pickup our recycling our you know illegal dumping concerns um all of which i know are on most of your minds i did have the um I was very pleased to get an email today actually from the division of refuse that went over some of the specific budget um, 
you know, specifics that are going to be coming out next year uh, that were said tonight as well. Um, but they did not say, or they said that this does not include equipment purchases, which I was a bit concerned about um, because one of the, the big, you know, programs that's happening is the 300 gallon to 90 gallon bin transition and that we're seeing all over the city and uh, starting to see on the west side. Um, but this program, you know, was was brought up by the dispatch a couple of years ago, almost three years ago now, specifically referencing the hilltop and and our need to get those transitions to fight illegal dumping. And so it's it's definitely a bit of a concern to see that parts of our neighborhood are getting so blatantly overlooked. Um, we've heard a couple different reasons for why that is. And one of the most consistent ones is that lack of uh, an appropriate vehicle to pick those things up from the alley. We are a historic neighborhood, not, you know, not designated historic, but we are one of the older neighborhoods in Columbus. So we do have street parking. We do have those slopes in people's yards that were mentioned by um, Director Swager. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we're not using those as excuses just to continue to overlook our part of the neighborhood. Uh, as we go forward. So those are kind of the main things I want to make sure are definitely still being talked about. Obviously, you know, this is an environmental issue. Um, it's a neighborhood issue and it's it's quite a few other things as well. So this is not all on you, Council Member Ramey. I hope that we'll see some other council members get brought into this as well. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Leah. You know, Leah, excuse me, apologize for that. Um, we'll... Um, continue to work with you and in, in the hilltop to make sure that your concerns are addressed. I know I appreciate the director or assistant. I'm sorry, the administrator getting back to you today on on your email, uh, but we'll also um, make sure that those lines of communication are open. Um, we're working, you know, very diligently to try to make a difference. And so um, thank you for your advocacy on this issue. Our next speaker is uh, Tia Johnson, and I just want to remind you to state your name, your address, and any organization that you represent. Um, you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Tia Johnson, um, 1985 West Henderson Road in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Council member, thank you so much for allowing me to share. Um, the 2021 general fund budget reflects Mayor Ginther's commitment to closing existing gaps advocating equity and making positive gains in our community. The highest priorities, including police reform, affordable housing, and neighborhoods. Our public program began with the understanding the factors that contribute to solid waste and contamination, especially as we all look at cleanliness from a different lens in the midst of dealing with COVID-19. Our second objective is to understand the needs of the community. And lastly, to be a resource to City of Columbus as it continues to combat illegal dumping and increase recycling efforts. The results of our program received an overwhelming positive response from residents, trash collectors, and agents of change in the community. Residents believe by having such service will help reduce health risks, address environmental issues, and increase beautification efforts to the neighborhood. In previous years, an audit was completed to help reveal and um, I'm sorry, help reveal what are some of the opportunities and challenges. Recycling. Education and contamination seems to be at the forefront of the problem. Once a container is contaminated, it is no longer viable, viable for recycling. Our solution, we believe that offering curbside bin sanitation as an initiative will increase resident participation in recycling, saving the environment and the city in tipping fees. To sanitize a 96 gallon bin, the cost is roughly $10 a bin for a monthly cleaning service. Education. I don't know about you, but I've never took a class on trash. Education is going to be key and it has to be done with a collaborative approach. Organizations and initiatives like Swaco, Keep Columbus Beautiful, Neighborhood Pride and Green Spot have been instrumental. We believe we are in alignment with these organizations and we'll work together to achieve our community goals. We've also started our I Care, I Can initiative, our youth program that will work with students on the importance of understanding proper trash and disposal and recycling. The heart of our business, employment and job creation. Our goal is to hire residents in the Columbus area, focusing on the South Side, Linden and Franklinton area. By year two, we will have launched our Leadership Essential Program to offer a certificate to our restored citizens. The starting pay rate has been $15 an hour for all employees. 
Who Are We? Fresh Bloom Bins provides the highest quality and most innovative car and dumpster cleaning service for municipalities, commercial, and residential markets. We are the only female minority-owned business in the Midwest to offer curbside bin and dumpster cleaning service and the only company to offer service to 300 gallon bins nationwide. We are excited about the results of our pilot program and look forward to exploring broader solutions with the city of Columbus. Technology in combination with a common sense approach to cleanliness in the 21st century, exploring long-term solutions and continue to develop strong insight through data-driven solutions will be key. With that being said, we really urge members of City of Council to fund the initiative to continue for 2021 in the budget. Columbus is known for its collaborative efforts. Our hope is that we begin to set standards, share our success with other municipalities as a legal dumpney has been increasing nationwide. Thank you so much for your time and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. We appreciate your uh, continued entrepreneurship and and certainly the partnership that we've uh, been been working with you on um, prior to this. It's been um, a pleasure, and certainly your innovation and the work that you do is making us all better. So we'll we'll keep that in mind, and definitely. Um, we'll, I know we'll be talking further as we move move along. Um, our final speaker this evening is uh, Kathy Cohen Becker, and so if you would uh, keep your remarks to three minutes and name any organization that you represent, I, the floor is yours, Ms. Becker. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Kathy Cohen Becker, four two seven five White Spruce Lane, Grove City, Ohio four three one two three. That still is within the city of Columbus, though. And I'm representing Ready for 100, which is part of the Ohio CR Club. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity to testify. And first, I would like to thank you all for your leadership on community choice aggregation. Uh, through this program, Columbus will reduce its annual carbon emissions by 11% or 19%, depending on how you count. Either way, it's a huge step forward, but either way, we have a long way to go. So as you know, the IPCC has said we must cut carbon emissions 45% by 2030 and zero by 2050 if we want to have a livable planet. And aggregation will help, but we still need to do other big programs. So I'm just gonna touch on a few other things Columbus could do to reach this goal of 45% by 2030. Um, one thing is to creatively use the division of power to construct community solar projects. These could act as resiliency hubs, places where the power is not coming from the main grid, so if the main grid goes down, then it won't go down everywhere. We could be putting solar panels on schools and community centers, and every city building should be net zero. We need to lead the way on energy efficiency. We've done 30,000 home energy audits, and now's the time to provide help for homeowners to make the upgrades. We've also passed an ordinance requiring large building owners to track energy use, and now's the time to get them to make upgrades. And we need to address the split incentive to get landlords to make energy upgrades so tenants are not paying high utility bills. We need to invest in green infrastructure. Um, green roofs is a big one to curb urban heat island, heat island effect. We've also heard about urban forestry and city parks. And we need to support urban agriculture. Schools should have teaching gardens and community gardens should not be at risk from development. And we need to pave the way to transportation of the future. So Link Us is mapping out transportation corridors for the city and we applaud this, but would like to see a spoke going southwest towards Grove City. Um, we need to consider both bus rapid transit and light rail, and there may be federal aid for light rail that could become available. Um, we have to continue transition of personal cars to electric vehicles through building out charging infrastructure, and we need to make sure we have safe streets and bike lanes throughout the city. And finally, we need creative financing mechanisms to help us pay for all this. So Columbus is already a leader in PACE financing. Um, if we haven't already, we need to finalize the residential PACE program. We could use the Columbus Franklin County Finance Authority to act as kind of a green bank to help provide loans for all of these projects. And tax abatement should only be given out for development that meets high standards for energy efficiency, renewable energy, green space, and recycling. So these are just some of the things we could do, but we also urge you to talk to a broad cross section within the community to hear what people need and their ideas. And thank you again for the chance to testify. 
<laughs> 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 Thank you. That's that's right. Thank you so much. We always appreciate your advocacy. Um, it, it is really my objective. I'd really like to get the uh, residential PACE program off the uh, table in 2021. And so we'll be working hard to do that. Um, but but all of those are great ideas and we'll continue to ex explore ways to be innovative and um, or at least progressive in, in some of the things that we do. We certainly want to race towards that goal. Thanks again. I uh, really appreciate it. That was our final speaker this evening and, and seeing that there are no additional questions. I really wanna thank directors, Nicole Brandon, Amy DeLong, Michael Stevens, Assistant Director Stephen Wenzel, uh, Assistant Director um, Quentin Harris, uh, Administrator Tim Swagger, um, Green Spot Coordinator David Celebrezzi and Environmental Planner Rosalie Hinden for being here and providing this afternoon's presentations. I'd also like to thank my staff, Jeffrey Carter and Lucy Frank, for their help in preparing to, for tonight's hearing. My legislative research team that helps provide the research for issues related to these departments, Andrew Dyer, John Oswald, Naya Walt Walters, and Matt Erickson, and the entire CTV team for their tireless work. Ms. Angela Burks and Mark Mark Carter from the clerk's office and office of technology respectfully for their work in preparing our hearing for the broadcast this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It really is a, a team effort to make sure that these things are, are put, get, they get across and get broadcast uh, successfully. This will conclude our hearing on the proposed 2021 operating budget for the administration, environment and economic development committees. I wish everyone a great and safe evening. Thank you.